In a world where pictures of the Orion Nebula fill your social media faster than an astronomer's natural reflex to talk about the weather, one man decides to risk it all and share intimate details about how he captured and processed M42 again. That man's name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. Hello Team Astrophotography. I'd just like to thank Ben Chard, Matthew Ultzman and Judd underscore S who have been asking me for a full workflow video to show how I process an image. This particular video won't cover the dark frame calibration and image stacking that's in a previous video which I'll link in the description. Uh, however, this does go through a lot of um, my process for PixInsight, Photoshop, uh, mosaicing, color calibration, star reduction, that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully you enjoy it. I hope you guys have a happy new year. Uh, it's a long one. It's not very funny, but hopefully you get some tips and tricks out of it. So I actually just want to share my tips and tricks and I want you guys to become better too. So if you like what I do here, just hit like and subscribe because there'll be more of it over time. Enjoy. Hello YouTube. I've recently finished a new image of M42 Orion. It's been really nice to have some time off and uh, so I thought I'd come back to this crowd favorite with everything I've learnt in the last few years. I can actually show you my M42 from four years ago. Okay, yeah. So this was my first M42 from 2014, and it's it's okay. That's pretty good, I thought. I was using a pretty high focal length telescope, the 9.25 Edge HD. Um, so I really had to get my head around guiding and stuff, and um, it's not it's not the greatest photo. It's rough. The stars are weird. Um, it's weirdly processed. There's not a lot of depth to it. The clouds and the gas sort of finish about here, um, but it's okay. Two thousand years later. So you can see there's been a little bit of improvement over the last four years. Now I really wanted to focus on the dust in this one. So this is a really deep exposure as you can see. Uh, I've got detail, dust detail right to the edges. Um, the stars look much better. They're not perfect, but they're much better. It's just got clear detail throughout the image and the stars are nice and small as well, uh, which is always a bonus because when you're taking a nebula photo, you don't want the stars to overrun the image. Uh, you want to highlight the actual structure of the nebula itself. Um, so if I zoom into this one a little bit you should see yeah nice stars much more detail around the edge. So I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes about how this image was created. Before I do that let's just look at uh, if I do a Google image search for M42 Orion uh, you can see it's a it's a crowd favorite. There are so many versions of this particular nebula and the color is meant to be like a, a salmon sort of pink color. That's the natural hydrogen kind of color. But what people tend to do is they push it to purple. You know, the pur purple here and, and even this one, it's just a little too purple. Uh, it's a little unnatural looking to me anyway. And some people go way overboard with the processing. You know, this, this image got an A-pod and I don't want to uh, disparage the photographer here. In and of itself this is an amazing image. It brings out a lot of the dust detail but the sharpening is just so overwhelming in this. You lose that, you lose a lot of the natural clarity and natural smoothness of it I think. That's just my opinion. But it's such a popular target. It's really hard to do it justice because so many people have so many great versions of it uh, and there's a lot of bad versions as well so it's it's one that you can do very badly very easily. It's a beginner favorite because it's so bright and big in the sky that anyone can uh, can grab an image of it. So I'll show you my reasoning behind my M42. I ended up doing a two panel mosaic for this. So in my data here I've got the first panel. So that was my first panel and 
it wasn't great. Um, so that's the first night. I, I ended up having to redo this. So this is just hydrogen alpha. The moon was out, so I lost a little bit of clarity with the moon. Um, but I'll show you the second pa panel that I got as comparison. And there's the second panel there. Now that turned out a lot better. I, the stars are just a lot nicer, a lot smaller. I didn't use a framing tool or anything like that. I just left the camera where it was and shifted where the core was. So the core on the first night was roughly over the middle. Then I just moved the core downwards. And so I knew that those two would stitch together. You, I didn't need that much overlap, but uh, it gave me a nice squarish image in the end. So the first step for all of this stuff is, is to stack your panels. Now I have processed this image and I've written the processing steps up in here. Uh, I just use the normal screen transfer function to give it a stretch. Um, so it's already stretched. Whatever stretch you do, if you're doing a two panel mosaic, you want to apply a similar stretch to the other one. So I sort of did an auto stretch and let it do an auto stretch on the second one panel. So that they were both roughly the same level and they wouldn't look too, too bad once I stitched them together. Now the other thing to note is that when doing the core, I also did a lower stretch for the core. So, so there was one version that I stretched like that so that I would have more detail in the core. Some people suggest that you should do a run of you know smaller subs, maybe 30 second subs or something like that. So you've got a, a lower core detail. I just, it's all, especially if you've got a CCD camera, all of that detail is mostly there. So you just, you can stretch it and then save that off and use that as part of your mosaic. Um, now the other steps that I did in this particular image are dynamic background extraction Dynamic background extraction gets rid of that vignetting somewhat and that process is pretty simple. You just have to go through and add these dots in the background. So you don't want to hit a star, you just, you just want to go through and add a bunch of dots just in the areas that should be like the background of space, these dark areas, that sort, sort of thing out to the corners. And you do that until you've got, you know, I don't know, a hundred dots or however long you want to spend filling in that and then once you've done that you just go to target image correction subtraction tick all of these boxes you just hit that um, green tick there and it will make the change now I obviously didn't go through that process here but you get the idea that's how dynamic background extraction works the other final process that I did was the star mask and morphological transformation so when you've got your stretch like this, if you hit the little spanner here, you've got a bunch of values that show up. This is your shadows and this is your midtones. It's easy to remember, even though they're not labeled, it's easy to remember that this is midtones because it's in the middle, it's the middle column. And this is shadows. So we actually need this information and I'll show you why. I want the star mask. So when you're doing a star mask, now this is a stacked I've already done all the stacking. If you want to know how to do the image calibration stacking, I do have another video where I've gone through that process um, in, in a lot of detail. So I'll link to that video. This is all the processing that happens after the calibration and stacking. So here in the star mask tool, it wants these shadows and the midtones, and that's what you pull out of that screen transfer function. So I'll go back into that. I'll copy this value, all the shadows, and I'll stick that in here. And then I'll go back into that spanner, copy the value for the midtones, chuck it in there. I remove the ticks, so I have nothing ticked here. These are usually okay with defaults, five, two, one, and two, but you might want to change them if you've got really large stars that you want to try and reduce. Uh, but for something like this, there's not a whole lot of variety in the star size here. There's a couple of bright ones. And for noise threshold, there is a bit of noise in the image, so I'm just going to pump that up just a little bit. And then drag it onto here. You can try with a smaller preview if it's, this takes too long for you, but I find it doesn't really take too long. I'll just do the whole thing and see what it's like. So this will generate a star mask for us. There's our star mask. 
Now to apply that star mask, we just there it is. We just drag this tab here over underneath here, and the mask is applied. What masking means is that everything in the red is not going to be affected by whatever we do now. The only thing that gets affected is the stars. You can see them poking through the holes. So the next tool we use, Morphological Transformation for star reduction, is going to only apply to what's happening at the stars here. Um, now you can see I've got some dirty pixels here, so this stripe is where a hot pixel has come through, so I'll, I'll have to clean that up in Photoshop later. Uh, but for now, because I know that this mask is applied, I don't want to look at this, I will go to the mask menu and remove show mask, so I can just see my image. I know that the next thing that I do will only apply to the stars which is the morphology, morphological transformation. Now I've already done this to this image, so these stars have already been reduced, but I'm just going back to show you behind the scenes how I got uh, to this point. Now I used two iterations for this, so I'm just gonna drag this from the triangle onto the image, and we should see the stars reduce. Boom. Now because I've reduced the stars already, they're getting a bit too reduced. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even consider using something like this, but I'm just showing you how the tool works. So I'll just undo that transformation. And then the last step is applying that stretch, because if we take the preview, if we take the preview of that stretch away, there's nothing there. So I'll just zoom out again. So that's stretched, but our data is still non-linear, and that's with no stretch at all. So we want to actually apply this stretch before we save our TIFF file. So I go into Histogram Transformation, open up that tool, and use this little triangle here to pull that stretch data across to this tool. We will see it change. There we go. It's got the stretch in there. Then I use that little triangle to pull that stretch onto the image. When we do that, oh, you'll see that I've left the star mask on. <laughs> So I'm just going to undo that. I do this all the time. That's something I do all the time. I'm going to remove enable mask and we're going to do that again and it'll apply the stretch to the whole image. And it's all gone white because we've still got this stretch running too, the preview stretch. So I'm going to remove that preview there and now the data is linear. It's ready to save off and at that point I will save as and save it as a TIFF file, uh, which I've already done. So let's go have a look at those. I'll just close this. So the next step would be to merge the image. So this one's one that I've already merged. Uh, this is the one I ended up with, but what happened was I went to, uh, where is it? Automate Photo Merge. And I then went to Browse, grab my two panels. So that was panel number one. And then merge that with Panel number two. Where's my second panel? Here it is. So these are two files which I've processed the same way, stretching, reducing the stars with the star mask. And so they're ready to merge in Photoshop. So you just hit OK and it will merge those two files together. And there's our mosaic. So if I zoom out here. And you can see this is backwards because I'm using the Rasa. The image that you get is mirrored. So I'll just rotate this a little bit. So it's backwards. This is a mirror image of what it should look like. Um, so I will go to image rotation, flip canvas, horizontal. And there's what it should look like. However, I did see that once I zoomed in, you get those rings of death. The stars were out of focus. They were fine on this side of the mosaic, quite clean, but in here they just were out of focus. So I ended up having to go back and do that photo merge process again. And of course you'd crop out the edges to get the uh, get rid of those loose ends, image crop, and end up with your hydrogen alpha data like that. Didn't end up using that one. I had to shoot it again. So I'm not going to save that. I had to shoot it again 
a second night and go through that process again to get a much nicer version. So the stars looking better there, now looking clean end to end. And that's the layer I ended up with for my hydrogen alpha, which I think looks pretty good. Uh, we've got stars out to the corner looking sharp. We've got dust detail all throughout, all to the corners. But of course the core is blown out and it's not in color. So the next step would be to repeat those process with the color frame. So I went out and shot the same panels. So a panel here and a panel here in color with a color camera, not using any filters or anything like that, just an RGB camera, uh, in this case the QHY12, and that gave me a color layer. And I did the same steps that I just showed you there. I merged them together once I'd um, stretched and um, reduced the stars. But in, in actual fact, I didn't reduce the stars on the color layer uh, because the stars are so small on this, on the mono layer, I actually like having the stars a little bit bloated on the color layer because it gives the outside of the star some color because the inside of the star is going to be white anyway. So most of the star color you get is going to be on those blurry outer fringes of the star. So I actually didn't use any star reduction on the color layers. But what I did do was mask back in the core. Now remember I was saying the core is way too blown out here. Uh, and that's okay, like it looks dramatic, but that's a little too dramatic. So in this layer here, you'll see I've got the core. So if I toggle this layer, I've dumped the core back in. Now let's look at this without the mask. So that's the lower stretched frame that I dumped over the top and that's registered. So I've used the star registration tool so it completely matches uh, the rest of the image. Now I'll enable that mask again. And the mask, if I show you what the mask is, you can see I've just painted it manually. So I can actually take my paintbrush and paint in how much of the core I want. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If I use the black brush, we're back out. So nothing is masked here. Our mask is completely black. Now if I reverse, so I'm using the white brush now, I can actually just paint back in the core as I'd like it, uh, which is pretty good. But I'll just go back a couple of steps to leave it the way it was. Now the next thing I would do, and did do, is add some levels. So I've done something tricky here. I've brought out a bit of brightness, but I've masked a bunch of stuff so I don't lose the core. And this level here, so if I open up levels, you can see I've stretched this, I've stretched the black point in here to give the blackness of space. And then on, and this that's unmasked. Then on the next bunch of levels, I'm just pulling a little bit of brightness back out again because I want that brightness in the dust. I want to see the dust. But what's happening? Uh, if I look at the mask here, you'll see I've done a funny trick. The mask is sort of a black and white inverted version of the picture. What does that mean? I don't want the brightness to pull out the core. So all the core is dark and I don't want the brightness to make the stars any brighter because then they'll get bloated. I wanted this particular stretch, this level stretch here, to only apply to the dust itself. So a cool trick you can do, if I um, delete this mask, you can see the core just blows out. I'm trying to get the dust to, to come out, but the core blows out completely. So a cool little trick you can do is go to your bottom layer, select all, copy that layer, to click into that layer mask, paste in the image, and I'm going to invert it. Now this is a cool trick because it protects all the stars and it's protecting this core area. And I'm going to use, I'm going to adjust those levels, adjust levels, and because I want to protect more of the core, so I'm going to pull that level down. Now it's protecting a lot of the core and the stars and we can actually pull the white slider in just to give us more of that dust. The dust will be affected by this adjustment layer here. Now if I uh, hit Alt again so we can see what's happened, that's what we wanted to do. So it's bringing out the dust, but it's protecting the core so the core doesn't blow out. Okay, so the next step is our color. 
So our color mask is here. This is our color layer. Now if we look at the color layer itself, um, so I'll just change the blending to normal. This is the image that I took of the color, not blended at all. So this is just the color image. And it's a little bit noisy. There are some weird pixels here which need to be fixed up. Um, there's some more weird color pixels which will have to be fixed up in post. So I would go through with the healing tool and just brush those out. So I'd sit here for, you know, half an hour or whatever, going through and just fixing up those weird little cosmetic details. But that's the color layer. And the trick with the color layer is that looks pretty good, but it doesn't look near as good as the, the final result, right? Because we want to mix in the color with the mono detail, which I got, which is a lot more detailed. So in the blending layer here, we just change it to color and that's pretty good. Now we've got all of that dust detail back. Now we've got all of that detail that we got from the mono camera, but we've also got some color here, but it's not nearly as colorful enough. And also the color is a little bit noisy. So if I change this back to normal, you can see it's a, the color's noisy. So I actually made a copy of the color layer, this one here, and I blurred it. I actually did some noise removal, to be honest. I went to Topaz Lab, Topaz Labs Topaz Denoise 6 and I did a really heavy noise removal. So you can see the difference. That's the noisy color layer and this is the Topaz noise removal. So that looks a lot better. But there's still not a lot of saturation. It's a cool image but the blue's sort of a bit pale and this is sort of a bit pastely. Now it's really tempting to just go crazy with your hue saturation layer. So if I enable this layer, you'll see my slider up here is plus 50. Now I could go crazy with this and make it super deep, but and people do, and that just looks terrible to me. I like the color balance here um, in that the blues and the reds and the browns are all pretty even, but that's just way too harsh. Um, there is one other, one other step I haven't shown you, which is how I got the color. To this very even point. So maybe I'll just quickly jump into uh, Pix Inside again and show you how I got my color level to look uh, this nice. There's a color image. Now if I stretch this, you'll see it looks awful. <laughs> it's totally green biased, which is partly the fault of the camera and partly the fault of light pollution and the atmosphere generally. Uh, but that's obviously not the color we end up with in the end. So I'll show you a cool trick for getting that even color. If you've got a, a color image like this in Pix Insight, th these are my go-to steps. Color calibration. So I'll just take this tool and default settings. I'll just pull the setting across from that arrow in. And that fixes it a little bit, but now I'll go to the next tool that I use which is background neutralization. So this recognizes that most of the background is green and that's not correct and background neutralization will change that back to a gray. That's much better and the final thing that I do is noise reduction SCNR. Now SCNR sort of gets rid of the green bias. You can see it says color to remove green. So I use leave that as default because it's sort of very subtle, but you can still see this is sort of green. So I'll drag this in here, SCNR, and that makes it really nice and grey. So they're the three steps that I use to calibrate my colour stacks, and that's how I got that colour to look so natural. Because I don't want to, uh, I don't want the colour to be subjective. I don't want it to be my eyeballs and my brain just trying to show you or show the audience what the colour should be for an astronomical object, I'd really prefer that the computer and the algorithm worked it out and that's what I really like about that background neutralization. It knows that the background is meant to be a shade of grey and once it sets that all the other colors are natural. So let's hop back into the image as we have it now. So I've got a few other level adjustments here. So I've got another layer adjustment with a small mask here. So I'll hit that and you can see I've just darkened 
those two nebulas to just pull back a little bit of that brightness. And if I look at the mask, so you can see how that mask is made, uh, you can see it's a big circle. And the way I would have got that is by creating a big circle using the shift. This is sort of a lot cleaner than um, than using the paintbrush tool. And then I would have gone select modify feather and the maximum feather is 250. So I would have feathered it by 250 which makes it a nice gradient and then hit the invert to invert that from black to white and let that through. So anyway that's how that that layer mask worked on that and that just brings back a little bit more detail there in both the nebulas which is nice. Now one problem I had with this image is you can see there's this purple line here and that's because of ambient light pollution uh, which you know we all encounter from time to time. The bottom of the chip has a little bit of bleed here where it's just going into red. So I've created a hue adjustment layer here and you can see I've just pulled the saturation down. If we look at the layer mask for this one, that's it there. I've just used the gradient tool to pull a little layer mask on that side. So there we go, that's with, that's with it, that's without it. Now curves, obviously a nice little tool for adjusting your colors. And the curve properties here, I've just pulled back a little, little bit of the signal on the top end and pulled it in from the bottom end and I've got a couple more adjustment layers here where you can still I'm I'm still trying to deal with this background it's still a little bit purpley for my liking so I've got a layer here which removes some of the red this is the levels and you can see I've pulled the red across just a touch and I've got another levels here which just pulled a little bit of green out of the image. I think the because the the image is still a little green for me. So I've pushed it just a touch towards the purple red end, but not too much that it looks like a big bright purple thing. And there is a final step which I'll show you. So at the moment this image is huge. Uh, if I go in that's at 100% it's huge, but I've also not applied any sharpening to it. I've got this beautiful structure in here, the cascades and all of this dust, but you don't want to apply sharpening until right at the very end. So this is what I would do at the end. So once I've got the image the way I like, I go image, image size, I'll change the width to 2048. Now 2048 is still big, it's like wallpaper HD big, um, but it's also optimized for social networks. So if you go and share your image on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else, 2048 looks really good on almost any monitor or any device. So I, I'll change my resizing there. And at this point, the image is sort of the way I want it. So I'm going to flatten it. So I'll flatten image. There we go, and now I want to get this sharpened. And I also want to remove a little bit more noise as well, because there's still a little bit of noise in here. You can see it's a little bit noisy in the edges. So I'm gonna go use Topaz Labs Denoise 6, which is a really great plugin. I, I, I use it for both for planetary and for my deep space images. Um, now the sharp the denoising that I'm going to use is around six very subtle but six I find even for planets works works really well it pulls out a lot of that noise without pulling out the detail so that's the first thing I'll do that's much better now you can see how clean this image looks really smooth smooth as a baby's bottom that's great but Sharpening is the last step. We've already resized the image. Now for sharpening, when you go to sharpen, you lose the softness of the stars. You get all this extra detail in the dust, which will sharpen up, but you lose the stars. So what I'm gonna do is copy this layer. So we've got two versions of it. Sharpen, I use Smart Sharpen. I'll 
Okay, you see with this this level of sharpening, which is what I ended up using, it's pretty good. Like you get a lot of that detail in the dust, really lovely. But all the stars turn into these pinpoints, which I just don't like. You lose all the softness of those stars. So I'll turn the preview off, that's nice and soft. Stars are nice and soft, they have a bit of a glow around them. Turn it on, and the stars suddenly become these dots. They almost look like hot pixels. So that's what we want to avoid. And that's why I made this second layer, so I can mask the stars out again. So we'll apply this sharpening, and I, you could go like brutally heavy on this if you wanted to. Like if I bump this up to 266 and the radius, it's you know, the sharpening can get ridiculous, and we don't want it to be ridiculous. So I usually leave the radius down around the one area, and we'll pull this back to 156. And that's a more sane sharpen. It's, it's still soft and beautiful and buttery, but you can still get the sharp edges, which is nice. So I'll apply that. And now we want to fix these stars. So if I go back to the way it was, unsharpened, we get nice stars. Then I add it again, you can see the stars just become too too sharp and too prominent. So what we're going to do is mask the stars and a good trick for this without doing the inverted layer mask truly is you can just use the select tool on a star. Now you can see I don't have contiguous ticked up here so if I click on a star it selects every other star as well. Um, so we've got all of those stars selected it's got most of them you can see there are all the stars are selected so at this point I'll go select, modify, expand, I'll expand the selection by say 10, mm, that was a bit big, I'll undo that, I'll go select, modify, expand by 5, okay so we've got a nice edge around the stars and then I'll feather that selection so it's not just a sharp cutoff, we'll make it 3. Now I'll hit the mask option at the bottom here and that creates a mask. If I look at this mask now, it's only applying that sharpened layer to these areas we've cut out and I actually want it the opposite of that. I actually want the stars to be protected so we want black around the stars. Now if I go back and turn this on and off, you can see the stars are not affected or at least the big stars that were selected these stars up here still get a little bit sharpened but these big ones still have a nice outer glow of color which is nice and we're still getting the sharpening happening in our nebula detail but not too much and there is the final image which I think looks pretty cool and I'm really happy that you guys enjoyed the image as well it sort of did very well on reddit and my instagram where you can follow me uh, if you do want to know more about the gear that i use um, including the telescopes and the cameras and all of that sort of stuff i do have links uh, on my videos where you can go and find that stuff uh, on the amazon affiliate links that i post it's uh, just a joy to be able to get some time to to do something like this and to to do an image and the feedback from from many of you said that this was one of the the better or, or even the best image of Orion that you guys have ever seen. There are better ones out there. There are some amazing astrophotographers uh, who I really look up to uh, and I don't uh, I don't try and copy but obviously they give me inspiration as well to come up with processes that pull out this detail in uh, Orion. So that's that was the intention for this image to see the dust detail and I'm really happy with that. You can see the difference in color between the blue areas and the brown dust and how they interplay up here in the folds. Uh, we've still got some core detail which was masked back in. The nebula is sharp where it needs to be but the stars are soft and glowy where they need to be. So all around I think it's a pretty balanced image and I'm really happy with it. So that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this processing tutorial. I know a few of you have been asking to, to know a bit more about my workflow. So hopefully this behind the scenes of this image gives you a bit of that insight. I've had a really great year. The channel has gained uh, like 5,000 subscribers this year, which is amazing to me. Um, I really appreciate the support and I'm going to go out because it's New Year's and I'm going to have one or two or 10 drinks. And remember, 
Everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. You've been watching Star Stuff with Dylan O'Donnell. It doesn't matter if you hit like. It doesn't matter if you hit subscribe. Because as you know, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Thank you.